Time to get ready for the holidays. Go to oldtimeradiodvd.com forward slash sale and get 10% off of all of our great collections of old time radio, classic TV, classic movies and serials at the lowest prices to be found anywhere. Visit oldtimeradiodvd.com forward slash sale and save. P.S. For all the Apple users, I have a few drives that I purchased for Apple users only at really reduced pricing. Check it out at oldtimeradiodvd.com forward slash sale. You're listening to Horror Old Time Radio. Our last story of the week is At the River Gates by Philippa Pierce, read by Hayden Jones. Lots of sisters I had, good girls too, and one older brother, just the one. We was at either end of the family. The eldest, my brother John, we always called him Beanie for some reason. Then the girls, four of them, and then me. I was Tiddler, and the reason for that was plain. Our father was a flour miller, and we lived just beside the mill. It was a water mill, built right over the river, with a mill wheel underneath. To understand what happened that wild night all those years ago, you have to understand a bit about the working of the mill stream. About a hundred yards before the river reached the mill, it divided. The upper river flowed on to power the mill, as I've said, and the lower river, leaving the upper river through sluice gates, flowed to one side of the mill and passed it. And then the upper and lower rivers joined up again, well below the mill. The sluice gates could be opened or shut by the miller to let more or less water through from the upper to the lower river. Now, you can see the use of that. The miller controlled the flow of water to power his mill, and he could also draw off any flood water that came down. Being a miller's son, I can never remember not understanding that. I was a little kid, I still at school when my brother Beanie began helping my father in the mill. He was as good as a man, my father said. He was strong, and he learnt the feel of the grain, and he was clever with the mill machinery, and he got on with the other men in the mill. He understood the gates, of course, and how to get just the right head of water for the mill, and he liked it all. One day, he'd be the miller after my father, everyone said. Beanie was the best brother you could have had. I loved and admired him more than anyone I knew. He was very good to me. He used to take me with him when you might have thought a little boy would have been in the way. He took me with him when he went fishing, and he taught me to fish. I learnt patience then from Beanie. There were plenty of roach and dace in the river, and sometimes we caught trout or pike, and once we caught an eel, and my mother made it into an eel pie, and he knew where to get good watercress for Sunday tea. We had an old boat on the river, and Beanie had taken it upstream to inspect the banks for my father. The banks had to be kept sound. Beanie took Jess, our dog, with him in the boat, and he often took me. It was Beanie who taught me to swim. One summer, it was hotter than anyone remembered, and Beanie was going from the mill up to the gates to shut in more water. Jess was following him, and as he went, he gave me a wink, so I followed too, although I didn't know why. As usual, he opened the gates with the great iron spanner, almost as long in the handle as he was tall. Then he went down to the pool in the lower river, as if to see the water level there. But just as he went, he was unbuttoning his flower white and waistcoat. By the time he reached the pool, he was naked, and he dived straight in. He came up with his hair plastered over his eyes, and he called to me, Come on, Tiddler, just time for a swimming lesson. Jess sat on the bank and watched us. Jess was really my father's dog, but she attached herself to Beanie. Oh, she loved Beanie. Everyone loved Beanie. Just sometimes he'd say, I'm off on me own now, Tiddler. And then I knew better than to ask to go with him. He'd go sauntering up the riverbank by himself, except for Jess at his heels. Just the river and the riverbank were happiness and everything. He was still not old enough to have got himself a girl, which might have changed things a bit. But he wasn't too young to go to the war. The war broke out in 1914 when I was still a boy and Beanie went. 
It was sad without Beanie, but it was worse than that. There was fear in the house. My parents became gloomy and somehow secret. So many young men were being killed at the front. Other families in the village had had word of a son's death. The news came in a telegram. I overheard my parents talking of those deaths, those telegrams, although not in front of the girls or me. So every time Beanie came home on leave alive, we was lucky. But when Beanie came, he was different. He loved us as much, but he was different. He didn't play with me as he used to do. He'd sometimes stare at me as though he didn't see me. And when I shouted Beanie and rushed at him, he would start as if he'd woken up. Then he'd smile and be good to me, almost as he used to be. But more often than he used to, he'd be off all by himself up the river bank with Jess at his heels. The mother, who longed to have him within her sight for every minute of his leave, used to watch him go and sigh. Once... One of the girls was asking Beanie about the front and the trenches, and he was telling her this and that, and we was all interested, and suddenly he stopped and said, No, it's hell. And he walked away alone up the green, quiet river bank. I suppose if one place was hell, then the other was heaven to him. After Beanie's leaves were over, the mill house was gloomy again, and the father had to work harder without Beanie's help in the mill. Nowadays he had to work the gates all by himself, a thing that Beanie had been taken over from him. If the gates needed working at night, my father and Beanie had always gone there together. My mother hated it nowadays when my father had to go to the gates alone at night. She was afraid he'd slip and fall in the water. And although he could swim, accidents could happen to a man alone in the dark. But of course my father wouldn't let her come with him, or any of my sisters. And I was still considered much too young. Well, one season had been very dry, and the river level had dropped. The gates were kept shut to get up a head of water for the mill. Then clouds began to build up heavily on the horizon, and my father said he was sure it was going to rain, but it didn't. All day storms rumbled in the distance. In the evening, the rain began. It rained steadily. My father had already been once to the gates to open the flashes. He was back at home, drying off in front of the fire. And the rain still drove against the windows. My mother said, Oh, it can't come down worse than this. She and my sisters were still up with my father. Even I wasn't in bed, although I was supposed to have been. No one could have slept for the noise of the rain. Suddenly the storm grew worse. Much worse. It seemed to explode over our heads. We heard a pane of glass in the skylight over the stairs shatter with the force of it. And my sisters ran with buckets to catch the water pouring through. Oddly, my mother didn't go to see the damage. She stayed with my father, watching him like a lynx. He was fidgeting up and down, paying no attention to the skylight either. And suddenly he said he'd have to go up to the gates again and open everything to carry all possible flood water into the lower river. Now this is what my mother had been dreading. She made a great outcry, but she knew it was no use. My father put on his tarpaulin jacket again and took his oil lamp and a thick stick. I don't know why, nor did he, I think. Jess always hated being out in the rain, but she followed him, and my mother watched him from the back door. A few steps from the doorway, and you couldn't see him any longer for the driving rain. My mother's lingering at the back door gave me my chance. I got my boots on and an oilskin cape I had, and I whipped out the front door and worked my way round in the shelter of the house to the back and then took the path my father had taken to the river and made a dash for it and caught up with my father and Jess just as he was turning up the way towards the gates. I held on to Jess's tail for quite a bit before my father noticed me. He was terribly angry, of course, but he didn't want to turn back with me and he didn't like to send me back alone. So we all three struggled up to the gates together. Just by the gates, my father found me some shelter between a tree trunk and a stack of driftwood. And there I crouched, with Jess to keep me company. I was too small to help my father with the gates, but there was one thing I could do. He told me to hold his lamp 
so that the light shone on the gates and what he was doing. The illumination was very poor, partly because of the driving rain, but at least it was better than nothing. And anyway, my father knew those gates by heart. Directing what light I could onto my father also directed and concentrated my attention on him. I could see his laborious motions as he heaved the great spanner into place. Then he began to try to rack up with it, but the wind and the rain were so strong that I could see he was having the greatest difficulty. Once I saw him stagger sideways, nearly into the blackness of the river. Then I wanted to run out from the shelter and try to help him but he had strictly forbidden me to do any such thing. And I knew he was right. Young as I was, I knew, it came to me as I watched him, that he couldn't manage the gates alone in that storm. I suppose he was a man already just past the prime of his strength. And the wind and the rain was beating him. The river would beat him. I shone the light as steadily as I could and gripped Jess by the collar and I think I prayed. I was so frightened then that afterwards, when I wasn't frightened, I could never be sure of what I'd seen. Through the confusion of the storm, I saw my father struggling and staggering, and as I peered and peered, my vision seemed to blur and to double, so that I, I began sometimes to see one man, and sometimes two. My father seemed to have a, a shadow self, besides himself, who steadied him, heaved with him, worked with him, and at last together they'd open the sluice gates and let the flood through. When it was done, my father came back to where Jess and I were and leant against the tree. He was gasping for breath and exhausted, and had a look on his face that I, that I cannot describe. From his expression, I knew that he had felt the shadow with him, just as I had seen him. And Jess was agitated, too, straining against my hold, whining. I looked past my father, and I could still see something by the sluice gates, a shadow that had separated itself from my father and lingered there. I don't know how I could have seen it in the darkness. My father slowly turned and looked in the direction that he saw me looking. The shadow began to move away from the gates, away from us. It began to go up the long river bank, beyond the gates, into the darkness there. Jess wriggled from my grasp and was across the gates and up the river bank following the vanished shadow. I had made no move, uttered no word, but my father said to me, Let him go. I looked up at him and his face was streaming with tears, as well as with the rain. He took my hand, and we fought our way back to the house. The whole house was lit up to light us home, and my mother stood at the back door waiting. She gave a cry of horror when she saw me with my father, and then she saw his face, and her own went quite white. He stumbled into her arms, and he sobbed and sobbed. I didn't know until that night that grown men could cry. The next day, the telegram came to say that Beanie had been killed in action in Flanders. It was some time after that that Jess came home. She was wet through. My mother thought she was ill, for she sat shivering by the fire, and for two days would neither eat nor drink. My father said, let it be. Well, I'm an old man. It all happened so many years ago. But I've never forgotten my brother Beanie. He was so good to us all. Hayden Jones read At the River Gates by Philippa Pierce and the producer was Dan Garrett.